Hey guys, this is Elise. Welcome back to Catholic Christian Friends for Intersectional Racial Healing Project. Today, I'm going to be introducing one of my best friends, Udi. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Who is one of the panelists. It's so good to have you in this project with me and other friends, Udi. Um, for this intro video, you know, since we've known each other for almost 10 years, um, and some people might be engaging with you on like a totally new basis as viewers and other friends may have never talked about this topic with you. Why don't we start from somewhere in the beginning? Like, um, for my first question, uh, when did you first experience, when did you first have a racial experience of some kind and become aware? Yeah, so um, I grew up in this really small town where I think when my family moved in, we increased the Asian population by like 300%. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, so I think, weirdly enough, um, I did not really experience a lot of like racism or bigotry when we lived there and I think the primary reason is because my older brother was like a football star right and no one messes with the football star in a small town <laughs> but I think like because um we were so like connected to the high school like um, my mom had all these opportunities to share Korean food with um people who like were part of the football team and like at different banquets and things like that and so really like our Korean culture was very accepted um, in that small town. Um, I think here and there, like I, I experienced these things um, that I never recognized as microaggressions until I was older. You know, so people asking me like, are you Chinese? Are you Japanese? Um, you know, like making fun of the way that my food smelled and things like that. But I think um, because I knew that my family was so respected in the town. I kind of saw those things more as like opportunities to teach people and not really recognize those as coming from a place of like, um, what's the word I'm trying to think of? Like, you know what I mean? Like not, not recognizing those things as microaggressions. Um, so I think really like strangely enough, I became more aware of racism when I moved to a bigger town. Um, first in Staten, Ohio, and then it was, you know, the suburbs of Columbus, Ohio, um, where I think there, like, you know, I didn't have that protective factor of having an older brother who was the star football player. Um, I became more exposed to, like, other Asians um, and attending an Asian church, um, and I think it was there where I really started to realize, like, huh, when you're Asian, people look at you differently, they think about you differently. Um, and I'm really experienced, or like I'm really being treated differently by my peers simply because I'm Asian. Um, and so I think, yeah, middle school would probably be the time where I really like became aware of that when someone like actually called me chink, you know? And I think from there, like a lot of things just like started becoming open and I became a lot more aware about these stuff. Mm. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing. So there's like, so many, so many moments in there to, um, that I'd love to ask about. So I'm curious, um, you know, maybe you, if you feel comfortable sharing as much or as little as you wish um, about what your experience was like at church and then also outside of church about like being the type of Asian that people are kind of like preconceiving you to be versus not. And um, and then how that like fell short at times or was too much of, and then on the flip side of like not being Asian enough, so to speak. Uh -huh. um, yeah, curious to hear about your experiences there too. To yeah. Kind of perspective, you know, for people. Yeah, so I'm Korean American um, and in my household, my parents speak to me in Korean and I respond in English. Um, so I have like a very elementary understanding of Korean. I can read it and write it, um, but it's very hard for me to um, speak it. Um, and so I think because of that, um, at school, I definitely fit in a lot more with other Korean Americans or just, um, you know, people who are not Korean or, or, and their primary language is English. Um, 
And I think at school, like at least among my friend groups, being Asian was like my core identity. I was known as the Asian and I really owned it, you know? <laughs> and um, <laughs> I think for me, like I really treasured that being Asian was a quality in my friend group that was like the cute quirk that made me really special and really unique. Um, and, you know, I was like, I was not like those other nerdy Asians who only spoke Korean, you know, amongst each other, but like I was um, this like cool Americanized Korean, you know, in my friend group. Um, but it was like very different at the church that I went to, um, where everyone is Asian because I went to a Korean church. Um, and suddenly, like, I'm no longer special and I'm no longer unique. And actually, I'm looked down upon because I don't know Korean. Um, and, you know, shame on my parents for never teaching me Korean, you know, like a lot of those like types of sentiments. Um, and so I think for me, like, I really disliked um, going to church because it, I, I mean, I think for one, like a lot of those um, prejudice of, you know, not knowing Korean was hard to deal with. But also I think because it was Sorry, my cat is rubbing his face on the computer. <laughs> um, cat is letting us know he is here. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> um, but also, it was just hard to have to confront the fact that, um, you know, outside of being Asian, what makes me special? What makes me unique? Um, am I truly just a really boring and bland person apart from being Asian? Um, and so that was definitely hard. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, oh my gosh, I have so many questions. Um, maybe I'll just ask a couple and then you can like run with whatever you like. Okay. Um, yeah, so the first thing I'm wondering is, you know, like when you're going to church and it was like tough for you to like, there's, a, there's all these barriers in between because there's stuff about race, there's stuff about ethnicity, like the race of being Asian, the ethnicity of being Korean, like being there all the time in the social space, like, hello, cat. <laughs> <laughs> like, how did, how did you, um, how did that affect your idea of who God is and, like, the image of God, you know? Um, whether that's, like, you being made in the image of God that was being taught or, um, like, how did that all navigate? And then something else I'm curious about is, like, you know, with that thought of like, am I bland is my only interesting piece that I am born Asian, which I didn't choose, that I didn't have to cultivate, like, it's just there, like, is that, um, like, how did that impact your sense of like, navigating self-worth, self-acceptance, and even like when you enter conversations about things like race, you know, since before it was like, oh, I'm interesting because I'm Asian. What was it like to enter those conversations about race too? So I know I'm asking a ton of questions. <laughs> <laughs> you can take it wherever you want. <laughs> um, so I, I mean, I think I'll talk about how like my, um, like coming to terms with my race also like paralleled with me coming to terms with um, who God is or like my identity in God. Yeah. Um, Cause so I grew up in a, family that called themselves Christians, um, but, you know, didn't necessarily, like, live it out all the time, and because I lived in such a small town, the closest Korean church was, like, two hours away, and because my parents are not very good at English, they wanted to go to that Korean church, so um, for me growing up, I saw church as a place where I could be with other Koreans, um, and uh, I think like the presence of God in my family was not very prevalent. You know, we celebrated Christmas and Easter and all of these things, but I never like really understood why. Um, and then it wasn't until middle school when we started going to a Korean church a lot more frequently and I began to understand more and more. And then I decided to become an atheist um, just because of the way that it coincided with a lot of like other personal things going on in my life. Um, I was a really angry kid. Um, <laughs> and so. <laughs> <laughs> I think like, you know, on top of being an atheist and not believing in God and really like criticizing the, hypocr the hypocrisy that's in church, um, like 
So on top of all of those things, right, um, I'm also no longer special at the church because, you know, as a reminder, like my token quirk was being an Asian. Um, and so I think like all of these things piled on top of each other, like really made me despise going to church. It made me despise being with church people and then ultimately, you know, made me despise God. Um, and I think once I began to reconcile that relationship with God, it also helped me to come to a place where I reconciled my just overall identity, you know, that I'm not just an Asian, but, you know, I have this like wonderful personality outside of my race. Um, and I think, you know, accepting that my race you know, really shaped who I am because of, you know, like the culture that I grew up in really shapes how I see the world and the things that I value um, and the morals that I have. Um, but also, you know, recognizing that like my identity is first as, you know, a daughter of God um, and who he made me to be. And he made me to be an Asian, but he also made me to be an artist and a social worker and a gamer, you know, like they're all like... <laughs> Udi is not just an Asian. Udi is like all these other things. And I think like I really had to learn that. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a beautiful, that's a beautiful journey. Um, not easy by any means. Um, and I think in maybe from my, I mean, I could still ask a billion questions because we're best friends. But um, <laughs> for this video, I think just the last question I'll ask is then, you know, as you were navigating all those things um, as a teenager, as a young adult, as an adult, like getting your jobs and things and encountering others who are in different places on their own journey, right? Whether it's with God or with their race, um, but they like meet you and they like see your face, you know, their race, their race first, right? The appearance. Um, right. How did, like, what were some of the experiences you had with, those encounters and the kind of conversations that would come up from there. Um, let me think how to navigate this question. It's, <laughs> I feel like it's always different. Um, like, so at my last job, um, when I did parent education, I worked in these really rural towns um and i would be met with various responses you know some people would think that wow it's super cool that i get to work with an asian because there's like none in our town you know um and then there would be others that would be like um that would really question um my credentials and would question how much i understand um just their culture and things like that um, and just really question, you know, just even my competence. Um, and I, I mean, I, I can't say that I've noticed a pattern, um, I think, but I, I did notice that it would, you know, go one way or the other. <laughs> um, but then on the other hand, um, actually, never mind, I'm not going to go there. Sorry. <laughs> um, just, just because, you know, I don't like, I don't know who's going to watch this. And so. Yeah, um, absolutely. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Like, there's things that we share, like, off the camera, you know, like, uh -huh, uh -huh. our friendship, and, and then there's things that, you know, are shared with others, and uh, mm -hmm. their boundaries are so important. So, Woody, thank you so much for sharing from your heart, and I know that, you know, it's just, it's all true, and it's from your life. None of this is scripted. Um, mm -hmm. I really enjoyed chatting with you today. I'm excited to chat with you and with other friends about these tough topics and um, show that it is doable and it doesn't have to threaten relationships or friendships um, just to talk about them. And with that, um, I have a couple non-personal-ish, more like related to the project questions. I'm curious, what interested you in joining the, and being part of this project? And what are you hoping others will get out of it? Yeah. Um, I mean, you're my friend and I support you. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So I just, I wanted to be able to, you know, participate and do as much as possible to really help get this project off the ground. Um, but I, I mean, I do think like conversations about race and diversity are um, close to my heart. Um, I think it's a conversation that needs to be had more and more and really needs to be shown that um, it's hard, but it's also easy. Um, and you don't have to have things, you know, perfectly, I mean, I think I have proven it firsthand. You don't have to be very eloquent to talk about these things. Oh. <laughs> no, you did great. <laughs> And like, it's, it's okay to be candid. It's okay to make mistakes. And um, I think we really need to have um, grace and compassion with one another too, as we have these conversations. Um, so yeah, was there a part two to your question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, that was beautiful. The, the last piece was just, what are, what are you hoping that others who view this and participate in it get out of it? I mean, I hope like people will be able to even reflect on their own um, experiences, whether they're a person of color or not. You know, we all have something to bring to the table. Um, and, you know, I think for myself, like I always feel self-conscious because I've never experienced such, um, I've never experienced like really extreme or violent racism, right? And so sometimes I feel like, do I really have room to talk? Like, um, it's it's so easy to compare my experiences with other people's experiences. But um, I think like you say so very often, like it's not a comparison game. Um, what we all go through is equally important. Um, and you shouldn't be ashamed with uh, sharing the experiences that you've gone through. I've said experiences a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I know when I go on camera, I'm suddenly aware, like I say the word, you know, whatever, a lie. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I, you know, since others probably have no idea what, what you, what you're referring to, I'll share just a little bit right now, if that's okay. So um, this idea of comparative suffering is, especially related to race and things of exterior qualities is one of those things that is a remainder of really bad and actually frankly evil science so like doing human experiments with the movement of eugenics um, on people of color and black people um, across the spectrum not just black people but across the spectrum of different ethnicities and different races was based on the idea that, well, they're less than human, they're not as valuable, and their brains respond differently to suffering and pain. So if we use them for human experiments, then it's not unethical. And mm -hmm. even the conclusions that were drawn were based on this assumption that black brains, white brains, Asian brains must respond differently to different pain stimuli and different types of pharmaceutical things, um, different interventions, and um, it's simply not true. Um, brains all around the world respond to trauma the same way with three basic responses of fight, flight, and freeze. And um, just because someone doesn't have, you feel know, like English as second language speaker, for example, if they don't have vocabulary to express their trauma and so they freeze up, that doesn't disqualify them from speaking. Um, just because someone tends to fight in response and they seem aggressive doesn't disqualify them from speaking. Just because they it, try to escape and get out of a situation that was so painful and to avoid it at all costs doesn't mean that they're disqualified from the conversation either. Um, yeah, so I just really want to invite everyone into the conversation, especially um, because these conversations, it, 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 can really, it can really add to getting to know each other better and um, even deepen and sometimes be healing for personal, con for personal relationships. So um, I hope that's helpful. And um, Woody, thank you again for sharing from your heart. It was so fun. And um, with that, we'll close this video and God bless. Stay tuned, guys. Bye, everyone.